Hey, this is Lucas Kitchen with questions from Atheist.com. Do you know what's in the Bible? Could you give an overview if someone asked you to do it? I began to wonder this for myself, and so I set out on this journey. I'm going to attempt to give you a full Bible overview in less than 10 minutes. It sounds impossible, but let's see what happens. Start the clock. The Bible begins with Genesis. It's as if we've happened upon God in the act of creating. First the universe, then life, then people. Adam and Eve rebel and get kicked out of the Paradise Garden. Their rebellion introduces pain and death. At this point, God promises to bring about a deliverer, but he's not clear what that means just yet. Genesis rushes down the family tree until it arrives at Noah. By now, the world has become a place of evil and murder. God drowns the entire world. All except for Noah, his family, and as many animals as he could pack onto an enormous boat that he builds. Noah becomes the bottleneck in the human family tree. The narrative speeds up once more until it reaches Abraham. God promises to bless Abraham with many descendants. They are promised a homeland and promised that the world will be blessed through them. This is seen as yet another place where God pulls the curtain back just a smidgen to reveal his Messiah or Savior plan. Even still, at this point in the story, there is not enough information to know exactly what he's talking about. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob, who is called Israel. Israel has 12 sons and become the 12 tribes. Israel's son, Joseph, becomes the second in command in Egypt. When a famine strikes, Joseph invites Israel's family to come live in Egypt, where there is plenty. Over time, they transition from being welcome guests to forced slave labor. Over 400 years, Israel grows in number, becomes slaves to Egyptian overlords, and wait for the promised savior. This is where the book of Exodus picks up the story. Pharaoh, Ramses, oppresses Israel. A savior rises up. The savior's name is Moses. Moses strikes Egypt with plagues and Pharaoh releases the slaves to go their own way. They exit or make their exodus from Egypt. Moses is seen as a savior. As Israel follows Moses out, they begin to make their way toward the promised land. Along the way, God gives the law, recorded in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Deuteronomy once again talks about a future Messiah or Savior character who would come into the world. God points out to Moses that someday he would send a prophet who is like Moses, who would ultimately save people. We are beginning to see a pattern, don't you think? So the trip to the promised land is circuitous. Because of their rebellion, God decides to let the current generation die off before he leads them into the promised land. They live as nomadic people for an entire generation until the grumpy old geezers croak. The book of Numbers is basically a census of the people and an account of their 40-year wanderings in the desert. Finally, they're ready to enter the land. This is where the book of Joshua picks up the story. Moses passes the baton to his trusted disciple Joshua. The book of Joshua is the history of the military conquest and dividing up of the promised land. So, the land was first a tribal federation, sort of like individual states with a strong alliance, but each was independent under the leadership of judges. This is where the book of Judges picks up the story. It documents Israel's transition from a tribal federation toward a monarchy. It covers from Joshua to Samson. Probably the most influential judge was a man named Samuel. He's got two books named after him, first and second, Samuel. Like the jealous neighbor boy, the people wanted a king. The nations around them had a king. Samuel argued that God was their king, but the people whined until they got what they wanted. So, in 1 Samuel, the prophet anoints Saul as the king. It's good at first, but Saul kind of loses his marbles. Toward the end of the book, Samuel replaces King Saul with King David, and things are much better. 2 Samuel covers King David's reign. For the most part, David pleases God. He was his time's equivalent of a rock star. We have his songs, some of which are actually prophetic, collected in a book called Psalms. Some of his songs give descriptions of the coming savior. David does have a few problems though. At one point he commits adultery with a married woman and then has her husband murdered to cover it up. Yikes. So time marches on. First Kings picks up the story and covers the history of the nation from David's death and King Solomon's ascension. He is credited with building an impressive and beautiful temple to God. Solomon was very wise but had a big problem. He had hundreds of wives and concubines. Ultimately, in his latter years, his foreign wives lead him into the worship of foreign gods, which once again included baby sacrifice. This would become a pattern for the rest of the time Israel was a nation. From the time of Solomon on, the nation was divided. It split into a northern kingdom, Israel, and a southern kingdom, Judah. First Kings and first and second books of Chronicles cover the rest of the recorded kings, some righteous, but most of them were corrupt and even evil. 
During this time, there are many prophets like Amos, Hosea, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. They inform Israel that it will be destroyed for her rebellion away from God. But they have a subplot running throughout most of their recorded work. I bet you can guess what that subplot is. Nearly all make mention, as a side note, of the future Savior that will come into the world. Little by little, each prophet adds to the details of what is known about the coming Messiah. The Israelites, at this point, can piece together a very basic understanding of the coming Messiah, but there is still many pieces of the puzzle that are not yet known. So, the time of the kings continues until the destruction of the kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and ultimately Judah in 586 BC and the desolation of Jerusalem, the capital. The Babylonian Empire sweeps the region, defeats Jerusalem, crumbles their temple, and carries off many of its inhabitants to Babylon. This is where the book of Daniel fits in. Daniel takes place in Babylon. The Babylonian Empire is defeated and taken over by the Persians during Daniel's tenure. Daniel makes a number of very vivid and weirdly specific prophecies about, can you guess? That's right, the coming Savior called the Messiah. Under the Persian king Cyrus, the Israelites are allowed to return to their homeland. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah pick up the story at this point. Ezra recounts the return and the rebuilding of the temple. Nehemiah furthers the account by talking about the restoration of Jerusalem, the temple, and the various obstacles that they face. There are still prophets in these days. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are the last few recorded prophets before things go dark for over 400 years. Before God goes silent, however, he gives a few last words to his prophets about the coming Savior, the Messiah. The Old Testament closes. The people have enough information about the coming Messiah that they should be able to recognize him when he arrives, but not so much that they can predict when, how, and who. So, the people wait for the following 400 years, without hearing from God directly. Empires rise and fall. Israel is now small and finds it difficult to defend itself as the empires around her grow. The people imagine the Messiah as one who will throw off the chains of their imperial overlords. The Persian Empire comes and goes. The Greek Empire comes and goes. The Roman Empire comes and stays, at least for the rest of the biblical story. This is where the Gospel of John picks up the story. Finally, after 400 years, a prophet appears. His name is John. He dunks people in the water of the Jordan River. Like all the prophets before him, he talks about the coming Savior. However, instead of vague, incomplete information, John claims that he knows who the Messiah is, and the time has come. He points to a man named Jesus. Matthew and Luke add to this narrative by giving Jesus' birth and origin stories. They, along with Mark, outline his actions and his teachings. The Gospel traced the life of Jesus as he, little by little, proves that he is the promised Messiah. To do this, he employs a powerful mix of teaching, healing, and miracles. He takes a handful of disciples who he begins to train in the art of traveling, healing, and teaching. He claims that those who believe that he is the Messiah, which is translated as Christ in Latin, will have everlasting life. Those who believe that Jesus is the Christ will have blissful immortality with him in his kingdom. He also accuses the religious establishment of being tremendously corrupt. It all becomes too much for the establishment, and they begin to plot his demise. He lays out his case for his messiahship for three years. There are many who believe him. There are enough that don't. The tragedy of the ages is laid out in stark, shadowy horror as Jesus is taken into custody, tried, and sentenced to death by the religious establishment. Jesus is brutally executed. Like most, he stays dead but unlike most, only for three days. He rises from the dead three days after his execution and begins to appear to his disciples. This is where the book of Acts picks up. Jesus leaves earth and promises to return to set up his kingdom. In the meantime, the disciples are instructed to share the good news worldwide. The church is born. Acts follows the various disciples as they begin to spread the word throughout the Roman world. Men like Peter, Philip, James, and Paul take the message far and wide. Acts outlines a number of missionary journeys that take place as the church grows from infancy. Most of the rest of the New Testament is a collection of letters that were written by those disciples to churches and individuals. Finally, we come to Revelation. This book is almost completely prophetic. If you're watching this video and the world hasn't fallen into a state of horrible tribulation, then you can assume that the events of Revelation haven't happened yet. We live in the small sliver of time between the end of the book of Acts and the beginning of the end times. 
Revelation gives a vivid account of the things that will happen leading up to, during, and following the return of Jesus to the earth. The basics are Jesus touches down to set up his kingdom. Those who believe in him for eternal life will enter the kingdom. Those who refuse to believe in him are removed. The last few chapters of the Bible talk about a restoration of paradise, where there is no longer any suffering or death. The Bible closes with Christ, the Savior who was promised from the beginning of the world, returning in victory to do what God had promised. Whew. So that's my 10-minute Bible overview. Thanks for watching.